Okay, well, welcome everybody. We are gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, give me one second. Okay, um, just so you know, and again, we'll go over this here in a minute, but we cannot hear you or see you. You can only hear or see us. So welcome to our very first virtual uh, Central Oklahoma Guidance Counselor Network event. I do want to welcome all of our Central Oklahoma Guidance Counselors, as well as I know we have a few Lawton Counselors on the call as well. So welcome to everybody. Uh, just to say you can kind of, I know that you can probably see the room here and see who's in here, but just so you can see our uh, faces here, I'm going to show you who, well, if we can get this to work, I'm so sorry. Let's see here. Don't know why this isn't working. There we go. Um, so we have Rick Fernandez, he's the coordinator of the Central Oklahoma Guidance Counselor Network, and then myself, uh, Jessica Schwager, and we have our information here, our phone numbers, as well as our email addresses. So I would go ahead and screenshot that, take a picture of that. If you have any questions or anything like that, um, feel free to shoot us an email or uh, give us a call. Let's see. Catherine, I just want to let you know that we see your chat about not being able to get on. Um, so please go ahead and rejoin. We're just going to go ahead and keep getting started here. Uh, before we get started, we do want to uh, do a few housekeeping items. Again, just so everybody knows, audio and video are disabled. So we cannot hear you or see you. The chat feature is enabled, so we can see any questions you ask in chat, any problems you have, anything like that. You can go ahead and drop those in the chat. Um, Rick and I will be answering those as soon as we can. Um, I know I'll be kind of doing the first part of the presentation, so um, I'll answer any questions on my laptop separately kind of after I'm done chatting with you about uh, some, some items here. Um, please util utilize the chat to ask questions to us please do not raise your hand. Uh, I know we had a webinar last week that a few of you were on and we did allow you to raise your hand and we would allow you to talk. We're not going to do th that this time, um, purely just because there are so many people on this call. So if you have any questions at all, just go ahead and drop them in the chat. Anything we don't answer or don't cover today, um, you can email rick at r.fernandez at occf.org. And just so you know, if for any reason you have to hop off or you're having technical difficulties, we are recording everything. So we will send that out uh, after this, as well as all the PowerPoints and any resources uh, that we cover today. This is what our schedule looks like today. Uh, rick and I will start off with just a little bit of OCCF housekeeping items. Um, and any kind of updates we have. Uh, then next at 9 to 9.30, we have Kelly Kellner with OCAP popping on. 9.30 to 10.30, we have uh, the Colleges That Change Lives presentation. And then we'll allow for some questions towards the end. Let's see. Okay, well, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, the first thing that I'm going to cover today is academic works. Um, I know that we, we hosted some new counselors here in the office a couple of weeks ago, and if you are familiar, if you've been in the network for a while, you're probably familiar with Academic Works, but uh, we did want to address a couple of changes that we've made this year, and one of those changes is now we have a three-step process to apply for scholarships. In the past, if you remember, students would have to uh, sign up, they would have to complete a general application, and then there was a third step, something called a conditional application, and then their recommended opportunities. This year we have narrowed it down to three steps instead, so I'm going to kind of guide you through what those three steps look like, and again if you have questions just drop them in the chat and we'll answer after this. So first and foremost, they can, your students, you can direct your students to occf.academicworks.com to apply for scholarships, but you can also send them, and I, I really like this website to send them here instead. It's occf.org slash scholarships. Uh, there's a big button on that website that says apply now, and you can see the arrow pointing at that, as well as a video that can kind of guide your students through the process. Just so you know, we are in the process of updating that video. Uh, this one right now is about five minutes long and has really good information on it. Uh, but we did, since we made a few changes to the website, we did want to go ahead and update that video with some of those changes. So here pretty soon in the coming weeks, we'll have about a 90 second video that you can send out to your students that will just guide them through all of the process and all the changes that we have made. So once students, um, again, guide them to watch the video, and then once they go ahead and hit 
that uh, that button to get to OCCF.academicworks.com, then you can direct them to go ahead and sign up. Now, I hope you all can see this. I know it's kind of um, on my screen a little hard to see because this is in the top right hand corner, but when students go to OCCF.academicworks.com, they will need to create an account. So in the top right hand side, there's a button that will say sign up. And again, I'm not sure if you can see this. It's, it's in the top right hand corner. I know my um, my little presentation software is kind of covering it up, but just direct your students to the top right hand corner. There will be a button where they have to click sign up. Whenever they hit that button, they'll have to create an account. Now, I, um, I really recommend, I know that some students use their school accounts or their high school email addresses to create accounts. I actually really recommend that you encourage them to create their own scholarship email address. And I say that because sometimes they might not have access to their high school email after May, say after graduation, May, June. And so I always encourage them to create their own scholarship email account anytime that they, um, you know, anytime they apply for any scholarships, not just ours, they can use that email account to register for scholarships and get all of their scholarship communications. So that's just kind of a tip there. Um, but so what they'll do is they'll go to sign up, they'll enter their email address, they'll create a password, and then they'll hit that sign up button. Now, this is probably the most important part that I really want to leave you with to remember to tell your students. They will hit that sign up button and then they'll get to this page that says a message with a confirmation link has been sent to your email address. Please open the link to activate your account. For many of you, you probably already started um, uh, encouraging your students to apply for scholarships because we opened the system on October 1st. And so you probably already encountered this the problem with those emails going straight into their spam account. Now, um, I want to show you what spam looks like just so you can guide your students. Um, we're trying to put as much language as we can on our website to tell them to check their spam. Um, unfortunately, there is just nothing we can do. We really hoped that we could kind of combat this problem this year, but this seems to be some sort of Gmail issue, not necessarily an academic works issue. So we just got to keep getting the messaging out there to check their spam. I do want to show you what spam looks like in Gmail. Um, so if they if they set up a Gmail account, I know a lot of students do use Gmail. The spam folder will be here on the left hand side and it isn't automatically, it doesn't automatically appear. They'll have to hit the more button and then the spam folder will appear. Then they have to open it. Uh, I know I was not aware of a spam folder even existing before last year, so I know many people are not, and it's not exactly the, the easiest thing to find in Gmail. So there's where the spam folder is. I know Yahoo is very similar. And then what happens is that that message is filtered into spam, and this is what it looks like. It says, be careful with this message. If students hit this, oh, sorry. Oh, there we go. If students hit that look safe button, it will go, this, this email will move into their inbox. It does take a few minutes. So I would suggest that they go ahead and do that. And then something else to note is a lot of times, and we, there were students with a lot of frustration with this, this link right here, students were unable to click on. Um, I think it was just some sort of safety issue. Gmail doesn't want students, don't, doesn't want students to go in and click on that. Um, so students might have to copy that link and put it in a web browser. Again, I hate that this is so hard um, to actually create an account, but I just want to make you aware of some of those issues that we have. If you have any other issues, I know Kate um, Ferguson, you had sent me an email about some other issues about a student not even receiving the spam. If you have anything like that, just send us an email, give us a call. Um, we can kind of troubleshoot with those students and figure out what's going on. Okay, so after they've actually set up their account, the next step is that they will need to complete a general application. Now, like I said before, uh, this is kind of the, the really the first and um, only step to before students will get into all of those recommended opportunities. So this has changed a little bit this year. I would recommend that you go ahead and set up an account on your own um, and you can kind of play around in there, uh, see what questions have changed. So it, it asks very basic questions about the student, things like first name, last name, address, things like that. But the difference this year is that we have combined all of the high school questions, so anything about high school GPA, um, anything like that, okay, sorry, uh, high school GPA, anything like that, 
Um, we combine into one section, but then we also have a college student section in there as well. We want all students, so whether they be college students or high school students, to fill out this general application. Um, I know we've already had a couple of questions from students asking about, I don't have a college GPA, and I'm, we're like, no, you don't have to, you can just skip right over that. You don't have to do that because you are a high school senior. So just encourage them to skip over. I think in the long run, this just completing this one step will be easier for students when they, once they kind of get the hang of it. Um, just a couple of buttons to note here. Um, whenever students first log in, they will see a finish and submit button and a save and keep editing button. I would recommend that as they're filling this information out, that they do go ahead and hit the save and keep editing as they go along. Um, they can um, they can they can go ahead and finish and submit and update later. But both of these buttons um, are really important to keep. I mean, if they if they don't want to lose their information, I would go ahead and say save and keep editing as they're kind of working through this. Okay, this is another change that we do want to make you aware of. Um, the transcript requirements. We went back and forth on this, and in years past, students did have to enter the name and email address of either you, their school counselor, or if they were college students, they had to enter the name and email address of their registrar. Um, we were encountering some issues with this. A lot of this had to do with the spam problems. Um, you were not getting those emails sometimes. Our college students were entering the name and email of a registrar that is not, that's not how they request transcripts in college. They actually do need to go through a formal process, get the transcript requested to them, upload it themselves. So we've really put the transcript on the student, the onus of the transcript on the student. The student needs to reach out to you, get that transcript, upload it themselves. Or you can just simply email it to us if they ask for it. You can email it to us. We have it here in the instructions. It can be sent to us. Um, but we will, uh, we will help them upload it. They can upload it themselves. Um, so let us know if you have questions on that, but hopefully that kind of helps with some of the problems with our the emails going to spam. Um, the other issue, the, kind of one of the other issues is that those emails were going to spam for transcripts, but then we also asked for letters of recommendation as well. And so there were really two opportunities for this e these emails to get lost. Um, so we've made it so the students upload their own transcript, but then they do still have to request a letter of recommendation. Uh, so they will have to hit this add a new reference button and enter the name and email address of a recommender. We do say it is their responsibility to make sure this is uploaded by the recommender. They do need to reach out to the recommender to make sure they got our emails. So again, we're putting that onus on the student. Um, please remind your students to read all instructions. We're trying to narrow down the instructions, but we know some of these things are really important. So, If I could add one oh, thing, please. if you in your school districts could ask your faculty to check their spam throughout the fall and the early spring, that really helps um, us get those letter of recommendations instead of having you, the counselor, having to forward all that information to us. So that does help when you uh, alert your faculty and staff to check their spam in their school district. Yeah, thank you, Rick. Um, we got a question in here as we were talking about transcripts about if we will still accept ZAP for transcripts. Absolutely, we will accept ZAP. Um, so we will be checking that. Um, if you get them sent over, we have somebody in our office that checks that several times a week. We'll download them, we'll, up, download them, we'll upload them for your students. Um, I am gonna kind of, kind of stop and address some of these transcript issues here. Um, Someone said transcripts for us can be requested via a Google Doc. Is that still acceptable for it to be sent from us during this process? They can also request to send it, but it doesn't take long. Yes. Um, so we any way, any way your school collects those transcript requests, as long as it gets to us, that's completely fine. Feel free to, I mean, if they have to request it through a Google Doc and then you need to give it to the student to then um, scan and then upload themselves, we'll do that. If the student has problems uploading it, they can just send it to our scholar at OCCF.org account and we will upload it for them. Um, we have somebody in our office completely dedicated to uploading transcripts this time of year, so we will um, get on uploading those as soon as possible. And if, and if I send you a report and it, and it says it hasn't been requested, you can email me the transcript. Uh, sometimes that's just easier to do it. Thanks, Rick. 
Okay, a couple of other things to note here. Again, we've kind of combined everything into this one general application. Um, we do want students to attach a photo. We do use that for, uh, especially if they're applying for CFS and NOS, we do use that for sending out press releases um, out to the media. So we really like to have that. We use it for all of our, um, if they're selected for scholarship, we use it for our booklet that we create every year. Um, we do ask for a FAFSA if students are able to complete the FAFSA. If they are not, we have added some language in here where students can um, discuss. So it says, please discuss your financial situation or any particular circumstances that you would like the selection uh, committee to consider when reviewing your application. We've added this question in here. Um, I know that there are some students that, um, they're undocumented students, they're not able to complete the FAFSA. We do not limit um, students citizenship-wise from completing our applications. We do not want this to be a barrier. So please go ahead and just direct your students to be sure to talk about any kind of financial situation in this. Um, we want to know if they're working three jobs. I hope they're not, but we want to know that information here. So let us know if they've been um, impacted by COVID in any way. Let us know. Um, put it in that financial situation question. Okay, so once they're done completing that general application, that first step, Again, they can always hit that finish and submit button. That's not showing up here, but um, they do need to hit that finish and submit button. Once they do that, um, then anytime they need to make any updates at all, they just need to go in and hit that update your application button. Update your application basically just resubmits the application again. Um, so really just have them, that kind of serves as a submit one more time. They can just keep submitting um, through whatever deadline they have. So um, just make sure that fin once they do the finish and submit, then anytime after that, it will say update your application and that updates their application with current information. So once they're done with that, Oh, I do, sorry, I do wanna point out one thing here. Um, this is how they check their, uh, their references. So up in the top on the navigation bar, there's a button that says references and active. They can go ahead and check there and see if their reference has submitted their letter of recommendation, if they've opened it, if they've started on it. They can, I think it's important to note that sometimes students do enter the wrong email address for their recommender. There might be a typo. Um, so they can see that under references as well, and they can make changes to that. So just wanted to point that out there. Okay. So once they uh, go ahead and submit that general application, the system takes everything from the general application. So it says, hey, the student is from Capitol Hill and they have this GPA. Here are some recommended scholarship opportunities that you should apply for. Um, so I went ahead and pulled, I'm gonna pull this up here real quick. Uh, well, I'm sorry, one second. Ignore me. Okay, I think I must have missed a screen here. I'm so sorry. Um, the very first time they go in there, it'll say, hey, you might be eligible to apply for these scholarships, and it presents 25 scholarships to them. Um, they can click on the name of the scholarship to see all of the different eligibility requirements. They can see the award amounts over here, and then all they have to do to see the questions is hit apply. So when they hit apply, that then takes them to the application. So I'd really encourage your students to read all of the descriptions. I know last year we had one student who, oh, she was so thorough and she read every single description, or maybe she did, maybe she didn't read every single description, I'm sorry, but I think she, uh, she went in and applied for every single scholarship we had, all 150 scholarships, she went in and applied for every single one of them. And I think maybe she just didn't read the descriptions and um, she really wasn't eligible for any of them. Um, so make sure your students are reading these descriptions, making sure they uh, really uh, meet these requirements before they apply. Um, so, for, so for many of these, like this OG&E scholarship, OG&E can make their decisions purely based on everything that's on that general application, and then they just need the students to upload a copy of their OG&E electric bill. Um, so really, the committee can see everything that's on the general app as in addition to this second, this other question. So a lot of these um, might just have one or two questions in here that students need to answer. And once they hit finish and submit, then we'll use their general application and these supplemental questions to make decisions. Um, so a lot of times this doesn't take very long for them to fly through these and um, see what they might be eligible for. Um, some language I wanted to point out. I have gone back and forth with academic works and said this is a little bit confusing, so I want to point this out. 
um, students can see. So the system will automatically recommend things for them to apply for. Um, but your students might want to see everything we have to offer. I know that um, I, I really like to see all of that. So they can hit recommended here under opportunities and they can hit recommended and then it'll show them what's recommended to them. But they can also hit our, ours and ours will take them to everything we have to offer. The ours language is a little bit confusing. I'm so sorry. I was just trying to get with academic groups and say, can we change this at all? And they said, nope, this is hard coded. You have to go to ours. So if they go to ours, they can see all of our opportunities that we have to offer in general. Um, some students just like to flip through and see if they, maybe if you know something happened, they happen to put something in wrong on their general application um, and then it's not recommended to them. They just want to go through ours anyway. These other applications, they can completely ignore. Again, this is hard coded in the system. It's not gonna hurt anything if they click on those buttons, but um, I just wanna avoid confusion there. Okay, a couple of things we do wanna point out that are different this year. In years past, the well, for the past couple of years, I think, uh, CFS, Community Foundation Scholars, and New Opportunity Scholars to apply for those scholarships, they were something called auto match. So all the students in the past had to do was complete their general application and then we had the second uh, high school senior application and if they met the requirements then they would basically automatically match to those scholarships. This year we decided to go ahead and make uh, new opportunity scholars and community foundation scholars and apply to scholarship. The reason being those auto matches sometimes, especially with working with so many students like you are, um, sometimes those are a little confusing to students if they actually applied for them. So we want there to be no question that they've actually applied. So we've just added this simple question, how would the scholarship impact your education? And then we do say, hey, did you upload a photo on the general application? All we're asking once they hit finish and submit and they met all the requirements, they will go into that uh, Community Foundation Scholars Pool. Same with NOS. Again, describe one leadership or community service activity or experience outside the classroom that you value. Um, so they fill this out, hit finish and submit, they're eligible for new opportunity scholars. So just be, uh, just be mindful of that change. Uh, to point out, just because I know we have some Lawton folks on here as well, Lawton has not changed. Lawton is still an auto match. We just don't have, you know, as many students applying for Lawton Community Foundation Scholars as we do from the 53 network schools. So um, we're just gonna keep that the same as long as the Lawton Community Foundation Scholars students who are applying for that have filled out the general application and meet these requirements. If they're from one of these high schools in a Lawton area and they meet these requirements, they will automatically be matched to the scholarship and be qualified. Um, if you have questions, I know Wanda will run a um, list of applicants, but if you have questions on if a student actually qualified or applied or is making it into the pool, um, go ahead and check with Wanda, mentor on that. I did want to point out, I'm not going to spend too long on this, but um, we do have some new scholarships that are in Academic Works this year. There's one specifically for Cassidy students called the Sarah Elizabeth Stewart Scholarship. We had the um, OKC Downtown Lions Club scholarship that's added into the system for these high schools listed here. And then we have two new scholarships, uh, one for Harding Charter Prep and one for Harding Fine Arts that are now in the system. So those are in addition to anything we had to offer last year. Um, if you need any fall brochures, um, they look like this. Um, I think that each of you were sent one at least already. Um, Rick is getting those out too. Wanda has sent all of her Lawton counselors those fall brochures. I think you should have received a packet of information probably last week. But if you need any more of these, definitely let us know. Um, we also are working through um, uh, creating these again. So I know last year at your spring workshop, we created these um, little flyers that were specific to your school. We do have to do a few updates because we've added a few scholarships. So we'll get those updated um, and send those out to you as well here in the next few weeks. So that, that'll be good. You can print those off and or, or email them out to your student just so they can kind of be familiar with some of the scholarships they're looking for uh, in the system. Did I forget anything, Rick? I'm gonna make sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're maybe good on academic works. Um, we did want to just kind of show you some resources here. Again, we'll send this. We'll send this out so you can have these links and everything. But we do have a resource, uh, Central Oklahoma Guidance Counselor Network resource page on our website. 
Um, we do have, if you're interested in um, seeing any kind of press releases or anything like that, we have those on our website as well. Um, our communications team does a fantastic job of keeping all of that up to date. You're probably seeing promotions in the papers right now online. We're starting to promote all of our scholarships, so um, just wanted to let you know about that as well. And I think that's all I have for academic works. Again, if you have questions about academic works, um, please just drop those in the chat. Feel free to email me, um, but I'll get those answered kind of as we go along here. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to Rick to uh, talk through some, uh, oh, sorry here, um, to talk through some of his uh, NOS and CFS issues here. So let me, um, and so just a reminder, the Lawton uh, counselors, Wanda couldn't be here today. So uh, we're filling in for the best we can. But like I said, uh, just email uh, Wanda if you need anything. So uh, I'm just going to dive right in because I know I've already started promoting Community Foundation Scholars to you. This is a guaranteed scholarship at your school. And it's $2,000. Each school is allotted a certain number of scholars based on enrollment. So if you have any questions on that, let me know. But I will send you out. Uh, the uh, Lot career School here pretty soon. Um, sometimes we award more Community Foundation Scholars based on um, uh, budgets here uh, than, um, uh, than, we, than we allot. It just depends. So I just want you to know that. Please be mindful of the scholarship timeline. All the documents you need are on the website um, that we just showed you uh, for the Central Oklahoma Guidance Counselor Network, but I will email you those documents like uh, scholarship committee documents that we're taking in right now. And for the scholarship committee documents, if you cannot get somebody on your committee to sign or print for that, you can sign in their place due to everything that's going on. That is not a problem, uh, conflict of interest forms. So uh, let me know if you have any questions on that. Um, um, the deadline for Community Foundation Scholars is December 7th. I will start sending you uh, reports on who's applying from your school probably at the end of October. You cannot log in and see that. If you log in, you're gonna log in as an applicant right now. And so just keep that in mind. You can't log in as a reviewer or see any applications but I'm more than happy to email you a report anytime that you would like to have it on Community Foundation Scholars, okay? Once it closes, I'll notify you that it's ready to be opened up for your committee's review in December, okay? So that's the timeline, so pay attention uh, to that timeline. Um, I do want to talk to uh, the counselors that have senior New Opportunity Scholars first-gen right now. Um, you know, one of the issues we're having is having, getting, is having you being able to contact them or asking how they're finishing their uh, requirements. The work and Community Foundation Scholar requirement, if they are unable to do those two, you know, they can choose between either one, but they can put that in their reflection statement, why they weren't able to work or do community service. So um, everything else in that booklet should be able to be completed. I've emailed all of them. I've tried to stay in contact with them all summer and this fall. Um, I'm more than glad to talk with them through a Zoom session. If we need to do another one, uh, we'll be glad to set it up, but have them complete the workbook. If they do a virtual event, you can sign all the signature places in place of that. All they have to do is provide you the information that they attended a virtual event online, whether it's a financial aid workshop, an ACT workshop, or they're taking the ACT or SAT test. If they're unable to take the ACT or SAT test, you need to let me know, because um, we do need them to take that test. So please be in contact with me on those issues right there. Remember, these are $2,000 scholarships that these students can get. They can go anywhere in the United States to a two-year, four-year vocational technical school, and they can be deferred. The nice thing about this scholarship is these students are eligible to reapply while they're in college for a second, third, and fourth year scholarship if they stay in state. So this scholarship potentially could be worth $8,000 to that student, okay? So I'm here to answer any questions anytime you want on the new opportunity scholars. I'm willing to talk to them. If you're not able to get in contact with them, let me know. I just did a mailing to them uh, because I want to know how they're doing and I'm going to need to get their picture eventually, whether I have to take it or they come to the Oklahoma City Community Foundation, have it taken, or you can provide me their yearbook picture. Okay, so 
A um, little concerned about these students because they probably are they're probably one of our most vulnerable pool of applicants uh, that we have at the Community Foundation, and we want them to succeed. The deadline for them to finish the booklet is January 15th. If we're having issues with that, with uh, certain workshops being offered a little bit later on, then I will work with the students and you, the counselor, to extend that deadline a little bit into February if we need to. Okay, so if you have questions, you can, you know, you can, you can call me, you can text me, uh, whatever you want to do, or you can chat about it right now. So that's fine. Um, the January workshop, um, we haven't decided yet, but most likely we're going to do it here over a three or four day period. And we're going to bring counselors in, in small groups. If you don't feel like it's safe for you to come in uh, here for a, um, our mini workshop, just let me know that that's okay. We're probably going to limit it to 20 here because we have the spacing for it with COVID-19 precautions in place. So we just want you to know that. Uh, I will actually be emailing you certificates after this program is over. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Uh, let me see if there's anything else that you might need to know about. Uh, just make sure you get me your committee documents. That's going to be the committee you're going to use for CFS new opportunity scholars or any scholarship you have at your school uh, that requires a committee recommendation process, okay? Once the selection process is done for community foundation scholars, I'll notify you of the winners. We don't notify them. Um, we're gonna let you do that, but we have to have a, approval from our um, scholarship committee with the trustee that's on the committee. So, and I'll make sure you have the emails for that all fall with all the instructions, okay? So I think that's all I have for right now. So I think we can probably let Kelly come on in, Kelly Kelnar. We're glad to have her with the Oklahoma College Assistance Program. Uh, I know she's been out doing virtual financial aid workshops and everything like that. So Kelly, it's your turn to take it over. Kelly, I am going to make you the host. Uh, wait, hold on a second here. Kelly, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, great. I'm going to turn it over to you, and you can go ahead and share your screen. And Okay. There we go. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kelly Kellner. I'm with the Oklahoma College Assistance Program, which hopefully you guys are all aware of us. We're part of the state regions for higher ed, and I'm going to walk you through today just some of the websites that we work with that um, hopefully you can share with your students in the classroom. We have information on college planning, financial literacy, financial aid, the FAFSA, student loan repayment, all kinds of different things. And this year, we've added a lot of new things, videos and online topics and um, uh, things that you can use with your students to kind of help them through this situation that we're in right now. Okay, first off, you can go to, that's one of our main college planning websites, which hopefully you guys are aware of that. Uh, we've got information about planning, preparing, paying for college, uh, we've got, a, you can see at the top, a scholarship button, and that takes you to a page where we list a bunch of different scholarships by deadline and by category. So this is another way, besides all the great scholarships OCCF offers, that your students can find some additional options to get money to help them pay for college. Um, as you may be aware, too, in the past, we've always sent out a You Can Go To and FAFSA Counselor Kit usually in September. And this would contain all kinds of materials, our checklists, our student workbooks. Well, this year, clearly, we did not get to print anything. So we have updated all of our materials and put them online. So if you go to our high school educators page, you can click these buttons for the college planning toolkit, the you can go to part and the FAFSA toolkit. And I will show you what you get when you're in there. Okay, so for the College Planning Toolkit, this is gonna list all of the publications that are in, that would normally be in the toolkit for you. And as you scroll down, each specific item will be shown with a kind of an explanation of how you can use this better with your classroom. And with the FAFSA Toolkit, 
This shows uh, also items that we would have included with our toolkit, plus some things that we usually don't send that are just online, like a FAFSA dependency questionnaire. We have a FAFSA parent flyer. Um, and we've added these new FAFSA learning modules, which you can see here at the bottom of the screen, and I'll show you those in just a second. On the right-hand side of the page, you see two blue graphics. These are also shown on this page, as well as some other graphics that you can share on your school's Facebook page or your website or however you're reaching students, but it just more of a promotion for FAFSA information to get your students connected with this. Last year nationwide, FAFSA numbers were down, and I don't know if that was because of COVID, since that kind of happened later in the school year, but I hope this year numbers will climb back up again. So we're doing as much as we can do to help you help your students to get prepared for doing the FAFSA. There's also two at, at the bottom of this page, this uh, short commercial, we have one in English and in Spanish that you can include on, again on your website that encourages students to do the FAFSA and it will tell them to check on our Start with FAFSA website for additional information to help them out. Okay, um, we included two, we've done this in the past, but with our huge high school student workbook, we've always done short PowerPoint presentations to go along with each section. The why I go to college, what do I want to be, how do I get there, where do I go, and then how do I pay for it. And this year we included those with video. So if you want to show those to any of your students, it just kind of walks them briefly through each section of the workbook and highlights publications that will go along with what, you know, what ties in with that particular section. So hopefully that will be a benefit to you and your students. And then these are the FAFSA learning modules that I showed you too. Again, these are new and we divided these up into five different sections about information you're going to need to complete a FAFSA, filling out the information to do an FSA ID to sign it, completing the form, signing and submitting, and then kind of what happens after that. So these are included on you can go to and start with FAFSA. And they are just PowerPoint presentations. Here are just some random shots from the different um, modules. And there's a quiz at the end of each one. So you can have your students go through these, take the quiz, Hopefully they're gonna learn some really good information that will help them with a FAFSA. And they can do these, you know, obviously at any point, uh, unless you guys want to do your own FAFSA presentations and then you can share that with them. We are also coming out to do FAFSA presentations. Well, we're doing it through Zoom, not coming out, but we're doing it through Zoom. So if you uh, want to contact us at all, Here's our request a workshop button. It's on the You Can Go To Publications and Tools page. Just click that, fill out the information, it'll shoot it to us, and then we'll be in contact with you as far as what you would like us to talk about. Doesn't have to be just FAFSA. We will also talk about scholarships, planning for college, finding the right school, uh, different types of financial aid programs. We'll do whatever you want us to do. Also on this page, we've added a couple of other videos. Again, there's a short FAFSA and financial aid video here, and then one that talks about scholarships, where to find them, how they kind of tie in with the student's financial aid program, and uh, some websites for them to use to help them find those types of scholarships. Okay, then I'm gonna move on to start with FAFSA, which I've already shown you a little bit about it, but the little TV sets that you see on here uh, these are FAFSA videos that we've had for quite a while. The ones I just showed you on You Can Go To, these are newer ones that we've done ourselves. So they're all still accurate, but just to let you know, this one right now that you're looking at comes in English and Spanish. Uh, we're providing like every week a new blog of information talking about new things going on with the FAFSA. And just to let you all know, um, you know, FAFSA.gov is the website for students. And then we've also been promoting My Student Aid app, which students can go on to complete their FAFSA on their phone, their iPad, whatever they have. But the My Student Aid app is not, or yeah, it's not available yet. They're saying they're trying to 
get some bugs worked out of it, and it won't be available until early 2021. So just be aware of that. If you're, you know, having your students complete the FAFSA, let them know that they probably are going to have to use FAFSA.gov until at least the first of the year. Okay. Um, students can also send us questions. You can see the little red dice on, on the page here. They can click that and send us a question about the FAFSA if they want to. U.S. counselors can also sign up for the FAFSA data portal. If you haven't already done that, that is a really cool thing. It's going to send you a weekly update of how your seniors are doing on their FAFSA. It will give you just your seniors and you'll be able to see this screen which lets you know if they've completed a FAFSA, if they've started it and it's incomplete, if it's missing a student or parent signature, if it's been chosen for verification. You can also see the date that they submitted their FAFSA. So if you're trying to kind of really watch all of your students and see how they're doing with this process, this is a really cool way for you to be able to set this up and, and look at it. Um, if, like I said, if you're not part of it, you can check it out on um, Start with FAFSA or with You Can Go To. There are a few documents you need to have signed, privacy agreements and things like that, but submit all of that along with the list of your seniors, and then you will have access to this information. The FAFSA data portal, for those of you that are already part of that, we just got the software for the new version for the new 2021-2022, that sounds so crazy, uh, for the new FAFSA. And by the time we get through it, working out all the bugs, it's going to be later in October before we get that going. So as soon as it's up and running, we will definitely let you know. Okay, there are also two under our resources tab at Start with FAFSA. Again, other uh, uh, lists of our FAFSA publications. Um, FAFSA facts and finish the FAFSA in five steps. We've had that for a few years, so you guys have seen that. We've uh, had a dependency questionnaire. We've got worksheets for the FSA ID in English and Spanish. And then we included just recently our FAFSA fundamentals PowerPoint. So another FAFSA tool that you guys can use. This one we've done every year, but we include speaker notes. So if you want to share this information with your students, you can see everything that's uh, on the application. We include screenshots of the FAFSA application, try to answer as many questions as we can about things that are usually troublesome for students and parents. But uh, this is out there as well. And like I said, it has information in the speaker notes to kind of help you explain what's going on with all this with your students. So lots of tools out there. Hopefully these can help you. If you have any questions about any of us, let me know and I'll show you our contact information at the end. Here's our finish the FAFSA in five form that you've received in the past. Okay, Oklahoma Money Matters. This is our financial literacy initiative. So we can do presentations for your students. I know they, your students are required to complete so many different topics of information on financial literacy. We can do presentations via Zoom for your students on any of these topics, credit, budgeting, identity theft, living on a budget when you're in college, all kinds of different things. And on our website, OklahomaManyMatters.org, there's a button for students, which will take you to high school student information, as well as information for you as K-12 educators. Uh, you're going to see when you get into our website information about lesson plans. So if you want to teach this information to your students themselves, you can print out these lesson plan documents and we give you tools and tips on, on things to do, like this shows identity theft, saving and banking, budgeting. There's several of these on here that you can use. If you're middle school counselors, we also have lesson plans for middle school students as well. And we also just added some uh, podcasts. And these also talk about the same types of financial literacy topics, uh, about understanding credit, understanding a credit score and how that works, uh, financial aid, all the different things. If students cannot listen to it through their computer, then we also post the transcript of the text so they can read that. And then each podcast has a worksheet that goes along with it that the students can print off and answer and then the, 
the answers to those questions are on the flip side. So that will kind of help them work through some of this information. Uh, we also too are offering every third Tuesday a monthly money webinar. And this is something you can call in and listen to. Your students can do it. It's over the lunch hour, 12 to 1. But we're trying to you know, offer these types of things if students have a chance to call in and listen to some information. This month in October, we're doing budgeting. Uh, you know, so we can cover all kinds of different topics, but we want to hit on some of the things that are most important to you. And then at the bottom, you're going to see a, a contact us. There's a contact us button on OKMM, and it will also let you request a workshop here. So if you'd like us to do a presentations for your students, your families, we're happy to do that. Okay, I'm going to briefly touch on OK College Start. I know some of you are using OK College Start for your ICAP process. Um, if you're not, you can still take advantage of some of these features, but OK College Start, again, is another college planning website. We've got all kinds of cool information on here for, for middle school, high school, college, adults, educators, whatever it may be. But on the home page here, the button that is circled here says Virtual Campus Tours. So if your students are thinking about the college they want to attend in the fall, you know, it's kind of hard right now to go and take an actual tour of that campus. So we have listed here links to 35 schools here in Oklahoma where you can take a virtual tour. Just pretty cool deal. And now if you're going to go out of state, I'm sure most of the schools out there also have these types of uh, videos or um, virtual tours on their website so you can check those out but we check these about every couple of weeks to see if any new schools have been added but this is a nice way for your students to be able to view the campus get some good information about the schools if they're considering going there um, also too if you are using OK College Start for your ICAP then you have a connection to the professional center and on this page, there are lesson plans, there are user guides for your students, for you as educators, for using the ICAP, setting up the ICAP, um, printing reports, whatever it is, as well as videos that go through all this process. So just so you know, that's all out there. And we're also doing another um, webinar on Friday of this week for you as educators to kind of talk about the ICAP information. So if you have not signed up for that, go to the Educators tab and you can sign up now and join us for that on Friday. Okay, last one, I promise. Uh, this is Ready, Set, Repay. And again, this is more about student loans, which I know your students are in high school now, so they haven't even really considered this. But if they click on the I'm in high school button here, which is highlighted, um, it can show them information about how to start thinking about borrowing student loans. Hopefully they won't have to do that because they're going to get enough scholarships that they won't have to take out a loan. But that's kind of a, you know, a given these days for at a lot of schools that students may have to borrow money. So this section give some information on uh, how to do it smartly, how to understand information about student loans. We have this booklet, Borrow Smart from the Start, that will walk them through the process and explain the different types of loans and how they need to be really savvy about all this information before they actually sign on the dotted line because we only want students to borrow what they need to borrow for school. And that was the button I clicked to get there. Okay, that's it. These are all of our websites with links and I'm going to share this with Rick and Jessica. Well, I guess they're recording all of this, but um, this just shows you who the contact people are for each of our initiatives. Um, we have email sites where you can email us questions. Like I showed you before, you can set up videos or workshops, anything you want to do with us and we are happy to come out and do that with you. Then here is my information. So if you have a question, please shoot me an email and I'll be happy to answer whatever I can.
But that's Kelly, thank you so yeah. much. This was so full of wonderful information. We had a lot of feedback and just how, how great information you presented. Um, just so everybody knows, like Kelly said, she'll be sending that to us. We do have a resources webpage for everybody, so we'll get that sent out to you. We'll put this on that resources page. Kelly, we did have one question um, here, just to kind of about um, some of the presentations you can do. Is it possible to send anybody out, um, anybody from your team out that can do a presentation completely in Spanish? Uh, like on the FAFSA, I'm sorry. Huh. We do have one lady that speaks Spanish, Ray Scott Pettit, which you'll see her name on there. She's not with our FAFSA side, but she could probably do something for you. Although right now though, our, we could only do it through Zoom. We, um, our tr travel is restricted, probably will be through the end of the year. So we're not able to go anywhere, but uh, we could probably do a Zoom video and be on there with her. So if questions came in that she was not aware of, then we could help with that. But. Uh, but yeah, that's, she's kind of our only Spanish person currently. So we will take advantage of her if we can. Great, thank you. Should they just reach out to you if they wanna schedule something? They can, yes. Or uh, what's shown on this page, all the, the items, and so these are our email links. So if someone wants to email, you can go to, they can do that. You can go to at ocap.org, send questions to us. Um, they can also, oops, trying to send it to mine. My email is kkellar at .org. You can email me. We're happy to um, help out in any way that we can. Thank you, Kelly. We'll get your you information to the counselors. We appreciate okay. it. Thanks Thank so you much. so much, Kelly. You bet. Thank you. Okay, everyone, as we, we're going to transition into our uh, next part here. As we do that, though, um, just one second here. As we do that, we actually have a poll. Um, we're going to get uh, the Colleges That Change Lives all set up, but we have a poll that we're going to go ahead and launch. Um, we would like your feedback on our spring workshop. So I'm going to launch this poll. We'll give you a few minutes to answer, um, but we're going to ask which of the following topics would be of interest to you at our spring workshop. So I'm gonna launch that right now. Feel free to take your time answering. And colleges that change lives, I am going to start promoting you all to co-hosts. Let's see, Beverly, I think you're a co-host now. Caroline, co-host. Christine, I'm working on you. Okay, I think that you all have been promoted to co-hosts. Can you hear us okay? Can you hear us? Yes. yes. Okay. okay, and we can hear you. So just a little information, I know I've, I've told you this before, but this is our Central Oklahoma Guidance Counselor Network, and it includes some uh, other counselors from around the state, but uh, we promote scholarships to the counselors statewide. And I just think um, your organization is wonderful, Colleges That Change Lives, and they need a little bit more information about uh, the college experience at the liberal arts schools. And maybe they're not familiar with the schools, but they have students that may be a great fit for them. Perfect. We're excited. Great. Very excited. We're going to give them just another minute to answer this poll question we have, and then um, we will introduce you all. Caroline, did you see Christine's email? I am now. Yes, yes, I will. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was able to throw in a little update on Hendrix news this week. Yes. Okay, can you all see that screen okay? Yes, good. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and end the polling, but if anybody who did not answer the poll, if you have any feedback on um, our spring workshop, just let us know. I'm gonna end that. Get rid of that. Okay, well, I think, if ever, are you all ready? 
Paul, yes, Caroline, and, okay. Well, I just want to, I know you all will probably do an introduction, but I just want to let all of our counselors know um, just a little bit about your organization. So the Colleges That Change Lives is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the advancement and support of student-centered college search processes. They support the goal of every student finding a college that develops a lifelong love of learning and provides the foundation for a successful and fulfilling life beyond college. I found that right off your website. I love your mission <laughs> statement. I think that's great. Um, we do have four presenters here with the Colleges That Change Lives. Um, Bailey Cower, Caroline Randall, Christine Bowman, and Beverly Henry Wheeler. So I'm going to go ahead and just turn it on to over to you um, and put ourselves on mute. And then if you have any questions or anything for us, um, just feel free to let us know. Good morning. My name is Christine Bowman and I'm the Dean of Enrollment Services at Southwestern University. I actually also serve as the chair of the CTCL Board of Directors, and it is my great pleasure to be on this amazing panel with these fabulous women. And our goal today is to share a little bit of a reflection into the liberal arts, and, but also continue on the conversation about the Colleges That Change Lives organization and, and what we do and hopefully allow you to become more familiar with some of our institutions that might be right fit options for your students. And so you see on the current screen, all of our information. I also wanna ask you, uh, Beverly is going to drop a link into the chat. We would love to have our participants register with us so that all of us can begin to communicate with you about programs that are going on on our campus, get to know you and your students better, allow you to become educated on our organization and our institutions. And so as we're going through, if you'll please take just a moment to fill out that brief um, chat link, that would be fantastic. And I am now going to turn it over to my dear colleague, Beverly Henry Wheeler from Hendricks College. Awesome, good morning, good morning, good morning. I am a morning person, so if you haven't had your coffee, you might wanna get it. Um, I am so excited to be on this panel with my co-presenters and one of the things and I think we all agree that fit for your students are so important to us and over the, the years that we've served together that's been one of the things that I've loved about our profession that the focus was on the student so um, Rick thank you for asking us to be a part today and I want to start, um, we're going to talk about myths today. And so the first one that I'm sure your students deal with all the time, they say students who t attend a liberal arts college will miss out on networking opportunities. And for me, when, when we were discussing this and talking about networking, one of the things that came to mind is, is community. And I wanted to uh, take a moment. I was thinking about this all day today or this morning when I got up. And one of the things that I wanted to, to define for us first as I moved through that thought about networking is that community is really the coming together of individuals from different places with celebrating ideas, learning new ideas, and having the opportunity to grow. And uh, just this weekend, if y'all will let me uh, share what I did briefly, my husband and I planted some fall flowers. And according to the instructions, they had to be a certain distance, but they couldn't have too many because they would overgrow and crowd one another out. And so when I think of community, especially thinking of networking at a smaller schools and thinking of what will my students experience at schools that are represented in CTCL. And so the first word that I, I really, if I was in class, I would have you write down is community. And what does community look like in a, a, a school like the ones that are represented this morning and then the rest of the organization that we have. What I want you to think about when your students are, are looking at our community and the foundation for which they will springboard the rest of their career. I want you to think of, as I said, those flowers. Uh, and if y'all are familiar, they were lantanas and marigolds, so I mixed them. I'm having fun uh, for the fall. And I thought about 
if our students came to our institutions, will they be crowded out? Will their opportunity to connect and network and have conversation with professors, with their peers, uh, with and, and all of us, even in the cafeteria, with our cafeteria workers, will it be enough space to be able to be celebrated, to be encouraged to grow, to experience growth? And so as you're thinking about and talking and having this conversation, networking is an opportunity for students to be able to be heard, right? To be listened to, and then also mentored. And so with that in mind, one of the things that I really want to encourage you to think about is when students are in class and they have peer review from other peers, and there's actual dialogue and communication with that. The opportunity to sit down and have a conversation with a professor who's looking into their hearts, understanding their desires, and helping them achieve their goals. So as you think about, and as we look at different things concerning the community, I want you to think about, for example, having the opportunity in what I call the residence houses, uh, to be able to grow, to be able to be involved with other individuals different from themselves and also like themselves. I think it's important that you talk to your, your students about what does networking mean? And it starts in a residence hall and carries over into the cafeteria. It carries over into the class. It carries over into the community with what they're involved with and connected with. So the myth that it won't be enough opportunity to network on a small campus, I want you to tell your students, they may not have enough time to network because they're going to have multiple layered opportunities to build their network. So I just wanted to, to, to you to think about that. We're going to pass it on to the next presenter so we can address a little bit more of those myths about small colleges. And Caroline, will you, it has the presentation side facing us. Oh, I'm sorry. And if you'll hit the display setting it on the upper left, Thank it'll you. flip it so that way it's a full. There you go. My apologies. Thank you so much, Bailey. Thanks. Okay. Let's talk about expenses and financial aid. Um, I think it is so common to hear, oh, I can't go to that school because it's too expensive. And I know that all of the counselors that are watching this today, they know, well, that's not really the price and you've got to go through the steps. But I think so many times we forget to remind our families and our students about this. And so we just wanted to reiterate that liberal arts colleges are actually not too expensive. There is actually an opportunity for your families to get quite a bit of financial aid and to make this type of education affordable. So as we look at the financial aid, uh, excuse me, the financial benefits of liberal arts colleges, most of these colleges have very healthy endowments and they are using that money to just dump right back onto their students. They're investing in their students. They have this commitment to support each of their students and to put a lot of aid back on them. Also, these students are graduating and finding much more marketable skills. We hear a lot of research about how liberal arts colleges are allowing students to have great communication skills, problem solving skills, being able to work in so many different fields. So they're coming out of a college, usually earning about 25% higher over their lifetime, have these marketable skills. So they're getting a higher ROI on their um, experience in education. As we look at our CTCL schools, 95% of them have the exact same cost for in-state or out-of-state or very close to it. So for your Oklahoma students that are thinking, well, I can't go out of state because it's going to be too expensive. We have four schools here right now that will tell you it's not going to be too expensive, I promise. Um, and as we look at our liberal arts colleges over the past couple of years, on average, 92% of their students are receiving financial aid. So they are not paying that full sticker price. I'm gonna get into some heavy numbers. I apologize, I'm not an accountant. Um, but this just kind of breaks down really the cost of what we're looking at. And so we have our, uh, as we look at tuition reset, and this is one thing that I love to talk about because 
I work at St. John's and we did a tuition reset in 2018 and we've seen some great benefit for our students. But also we know that uh, Birmingham Southern, Hiram, and now Hendricks just announced this week for fall of 21 that they are doing a tuition reset. They are actually dropping their tuition 32%, which is just insane. Now the reason that these colleges do these types of tuition reset or there's a lot of times where colleges feel like they need to get into prestige pricing. The more expensive we are, the more important we are, the more impressive we are. But so many CTCL schools realize that that's actually not the game we want to play. That we know that we're unique and amazing and we want to attract unique and amazing students. And so we want to make sure that this education is affordable for so many more students. So at St. John's, we actually dropped our tuition $17,000 in 2018. We haven't touched it since. Not only that, but we're still providing an average of $24,000 in financial aid. Our freshman class this year, 96% received some type of financial aid. We also have a very generous donor that has come in and offered to match all Pell Awards for the next 10 years. So any student um, earning any type of Pell will automatically get that doubled at St. John's. And so we've got our average cost of attendance at about 25,000, put average cost of attendance for my fellow presenters up here today that were ranging from about 21,000 to about 25,000. And as I looked just kind of very briefly at a number of different Oklahoma schools through iPads, their costs typically after aid range from about 15,000 to 21,000 and only about 80% of students receiving aid. So you can see just looking at the numbers, it is not a dramatic difference for these students to go to a CTCL school or to a liberal arts school versus going to a school in their hometown. And so again, they're just getting such a great return on investment. They get the small classes, the personal attention, that networking and community that Beverly talked about, all of the different student support and resources, unique opportunities and unique education without paying too much or more than they thought they were gonna to have to pay. So we really feel that this is a great benefit to our liberal arts colleges. And I just hope that you will continue to remind your families to not believe the sticker price, um, to actually go through the process, apply, get accepted, apply for financial aid and scholarships, and then see what that true cost is at the end. Okay, I am gonna turn it over to Bailey and we're gonna talk a little bit about STEM and business. You're muted, Bailey. Oh, you think we get better at this. Uh, so myth number three, uh, you can't attend a liberal arts college and receive a uh, strong degree in the natural science and the in business. So we know in our in this group here, we've been reading the articles um, and as they kind of pop up on the screen, we're seeing the doom and gloom start to go away. Um, there's the acknowledgement that we have a symbiotic relationship with the sciences in the business within the liberal arts um, and science colleges and university. And the value to this is the humanistic approach that our graduates offer to the success in business and science. Liberal arts graduates are often identified as adaptable to their changing environment. Employers, graduate and professional schools are valuing the soft skills that are cultivated and curated during their four years as they do more beyond just their track curriculum, but they're expanding and considering how philosophy, religion, history intertwines with how you engage with sociology, anthropology, business, the sciences, all of that makes up who we are as an individual. And I was reminded recently of an article that was highlighting Google, who did an internal research study about who they should be hiring, what makes their best employees, their longevity, their production, all of that. And what was a surprise to everyone on that was that the conclusion of that, the most important quality um, was not STEM. It actually was the dead last on that list, but it was the other qualities like being a good coach, communicating well, processing the insight into others because we don't just work in a single cubicle where we clock in clock out and we don't interact with everyone having empathy thinking critically problem solving and drawing conclusions across complex ideas 
And that's where the educational experience um, at schools in the CTCL consortium, but also beyond that offer the liberal arts and science intertwined is really helping um, society as a whole lift. And so as the tide rises. So as you come in um, and look at this, there are some key successes that are found in all of these um, fields of experiential learning research as an undergraduate experience. So quickly on the screen are some acknowledgments of what's happening on the science side at all of our four um, colleges and universities, but also across our entire consortium. For example, all of us on this panel today represent schools who have received an excess of $600,000 from grants from the National Science Foundation. And this is giving our students access to state-of-the-art instrumentation. They're providing funding for research conferences where our students are traveling and getting to present in undergrad. And because we focus on that undergraduate experience, nothing is waiting till you get to graduate school or even till that junior or senior year. It's the opportunity to start exploring that first year and not just washing test tubes. They do a lot more than that. And then the same approach is taken on the business side of things. You have to integrate internships, simulations, class-based projects to be able to build from the book learning that's happening, from the conversations to the applied learning experience. And so we really are showcasing how our colleges and universities are listening to our industry leaders. We're adapting curriculums, we're expanding to make sure our graduates have the hard skills. They're gonna have the accounting, the investing, the economics, those hard skills, but the interpersonal skills come along with that as well. The exposure to the humanities as well as the science really lend itself to a dynamic hands-on experience that isn't just something that happens at the very end of the journey, but happens all the way through. And with that, I will transition to Christine to take on number four. Thank you, Bailey. The fourth myth, you may have, we may have sold you on the liberal arts at this point in time, and you may say that is all fantastic, but I have a student athlete and they have big dreams to play sports in college. And many times the myth is that at a liberal arts and sciences institution, students cannot play sports or will not have a fulfilling and enriched athletic experience. And I'm very proud to say that that is not the case at our institutions. The Division Three, which is the largest portion of our institutions participate in Division Three, but we do have institutions that are D1 and D2 as part of the consortium. But the Division Three level is the largest portion of the NCAA. And 25% of the students at Division Three institutions are student athletes. And I think it's really important that we choose those words very carefully. While Division I provides an outstanding athletic experience, at a D3 school, the balance is very intentional. You are coming to get your degree, and the athletic experience is a complement to that. Our coaches have a philosophy that we want to teach skills on the athletic field that are going to be transferable to graduate or professional school or the workplace, because that is where the majority of our athletes are going after they graduate. They're not necessarily going pro, Although most likely each of our institutions has some athletes who have eventually gone into pro sports. One of the things that I think we value and as Beverly led us off by talking about fit, there is equal opportunity and um, access to the general student body on financial aid and merit or need-based aid when students apply to D3 institutions. They are not earning an athletic scholarship they are earning an athletic, an academic scholarship, or they are being provided need-based financial aid based on their family's ability to pay from the FAFSA. There are an average of 19 sports per institution at the D3 level. So this is not institutions that just have one or two things to choose from, and in a minute we'll flip slides and you'll see all the opportunities that are available at Colleges That Change Lives institutions. Caroline, if you want, wouldn't go back for just one more second. Um, I think it's important to also see that students graduate at a higher level 
that are D3 athletes. And so this is not a low retention program. These coaches and these students put in a great deal of time to make sure the end goal, graduation and going in to that next life phase is really an important part of who they, who they are and what they do. And these students are really connected to the campus. They are student athletes, but they're also involved in leadership. They're involved in service. They are engaged in academic honor societies. And so the sport is not the sole existence of their extracurricular life at our institutions. It's a complement to their academic and extracurricular life. All right, Caroline, let's show off all the cool sports that are offered at colleges that change lives institutions. Because we are all over the country, from New England to the South, to the Southwest, and over to the Pacific Northwest and California, you can see our weather will often afford us different sorts of opportunities, and our location affords us dis different opportunities. One of the really cool things that we'll highlight in just a moment is also the fact that we have this as a search tool on the CTCL website. So if you have that perfect fit for us and they want to play their sport, they can actually research that on our website. All right. So we're going to transition just a little bit into talking about what CTCL is as an organization. We are a nonprofit that, as was read earlier, is really dedicated to the advancement of a student-centered college admission process. There are some great names in our institutional list, but we're really proud that we focus on helping students find the right fit and helping them find the place that is going to help them grow academically as well as personally. We believe in that lifelong learning attribute that it's not just a four year um, educational journey, but that many of our students remain connected to us in a great way, giving back as alumni, not only in their financial resources, but in their time and energy, speaking to students, mentoring students. And so this really is a full service opportunity at our institutions. As an organization, we believe on pushing back on the frenzy that is the college admission process. Um, we are not institutions that students are not going to be able to find jobs and are going home. We're not institutions in which there's $100,000 worth of undergraduate debt at the, at the end of the journey. We are institutions that really believe in helping students through and in many cases breaking barriers or baking, breaking down walls along the way. We want to de-stress this process. Many of us have tried to make it easy from our admission to our scholarship to our financial aid parts of our journey to help students be able, students and families be able to successfully navigate this in the most stress-free way. While many of our institutions are valued and ranked, that is not where we place our focus. We place our focus on the value of our institutions, the unique elements that we offer our students and families, and how we're going to help them complete the college education process. And we're very proud of the, the one thing that is really consistent amongst all of us is the liberal arts tradition, that you are more than just a major. You are really a creative thinker, an engaged learner, and someone who's going to be able to make connections across your entire experience. And the organization itself supports the recruitment of all the member colleges. You may have been invited to some of our um, college fairs that we have hosted as an organization, we have one remaining in our cycle this spring, I'm sorry, this fall, as we weren't able to travel throughout the spring and the summer. And once again, filling out the, um, the link that Beverly put at the beginning of our presentation in the chat, that will enable us to invite you and you can in turn invite your students to our last program of the season. Our, to give a little profile of our organization, as we often give a profile of our institutions, we are two public and 43 private colleges and universities, representing 26 states across the United States with an average enrollment of 1,500. And so we are not going to be that large institution, that large research one. And you'll see a list here of all of our member schools. They are listed alphabetically. There are two that are asterisked, and those are actually public institutions that have that liberal arts value that have been recognized 
in our books and therefore um, part of our organization. And we, Bailey, I'm going to turn this over to you because this is um, a great opportunity to transition about how you can use the CTCL message with your students. Absolutely. All right. Uh, so as we all multitask, feel free to hop over to ctcl.org. Uh, there you're going to find a search engine. And as Christine led with, we have a search engine that lets students look by athletics, by major, by location, test optional, though we all at this point have moved there with our current um, environment. But What's great is as your students are navigating the test optional, you can look to institutions who have been doing this for a few years and isn't just shifting at this last moment um, to accommodate. So there's a lot of thought behind that. So this is a great alternative um, resource for you, for your students, for your families to be able to uh, help them think beyond that. But on the screen is also some important questions as they approach the college search. While you're on ctcl.org, you can actually request to receive a grouping of these uh, brochures about how to choose the college that's right for you. And everyone has a college where it fits like your perfect fair pair of shoes that you love to wear all the time, whether it's your slippers at home or your favorite going out on the town shoes. But it's an approach to the college search that moves beyond the simple question that gets asked all the time. Do you have insert major here? Mm -hmm. um, most schools, and y'all know, don't carry majors that they're not good at. It's a financial resource that the college is putting into it. It's, it's my favorite question, and I hold my tongue often to say, no, actually, our psychology department isn't really good. We like to, we like to just spend money there, um, but we do. So we know that's the starting part. We know that's the psyche. You, everybody wants to know before they walk into that store, are, is that store going to have X that I'm looking for before I invest time and resources to that? But as we get further along, check mark that first box, we want students and families to start thinking a little bit more reflective, to go past the marketing material that they're seeing and being able to understand what it means to be part of our psychology program or what it means in our areas of study that are going to happen over four years. Um, so often we think of just that freshman year, but guess what? They're with us for four years. And that's an important fact about our, our consortium and our institution is as much as we love your students, we believe they are going on to great things. And so graduation rates amongst us are some of the highest in the country. And that means they're with us only for four years before they start making an impact at the bigger level. Size does matter. Um, you don't always need a college that's bigger than your high school. Um, and there's a spattering, I'm sure, on here. And some of you are like, yeah, finding a college smaller than us is gonna be a lot harder, but how, how big do you go? How many folds do you go up from there? There's also not the guarantee that having a name brand is going to actually bring success. There's a lot of resources there, but there's also a lot of students. And so having and unpacking, what do you actually get to do and when do you get to do it? We all put our shiniest things up front, but starting to ask, am I doing this my senior year right before I graduate or is this something I'm starting right along the way? Um, we also, stories, everybody has those stories of nobody gets in anywhere, um, and that's just not true. Um, when you look nationally, more colleges accept the majority of their applicant pool than those that accept just a small percentage point of that. And as we talked about, you know, the sticker price is a shocking number to do. Everybody is calculating what type of nice car they could get along the way uh, if they did that, but we all put in resources to help your students there. And finally, it's a fit. Um, our president often tells those that are visiting campus, you can be as methodical as you want to be, you create your pros and cons list, but he, uh, he is honest and he says, at the end of the day, when somebody asks you, well, why did you choose X college? You're going to answer, it just felt right. 
And that's the experience that your student has to get to. That's the experience that we want to make sure as they're going through this process that they're able to vet all of the areas that make up the college experience that allows them to understand where they're going to see for the next four years, not just for the first four months um, and have that feeling of, yeah, this is a home away from home from there. I encourage you pop on over, check things out, some good resources, as well as all of our scheduled events are up there as well. So a great resource. Um, and all of our colleges also have profiles there. I forgot to mention that. So you can actually learn a little bit more about us as well as all of those that aren't on the presentation today. And there we go. We're ready for questions. If there's no questions, um, ask them how selective their schools. Bailey, can you talk a little bit about how selective your schools are? Or anyone, I guess. That's, that's open to anybody. I'm sorry. <laughs> the selectivity is going to range. Um, and on a broad statement, um, and not knowing every, I don't have everybody's enrollment metrics, but the majority of us admit over 50% of our applicant pool. Um, so those selective, not highly selective, is how most of us would um, classify ourselves. I'll let anybody else pop on. I'll, I'll jump in, because a lot of times I receive that question, and families are thinking about uh, the Harvards, the Yells, the Princetons, uh, which is fine. Those are wonderful schools. When I think about selectivity, I think about the process. Are we going beyond just test scores and are we looking at GPA and ranking and that's it? And we're, in, we're into, some of us are in Texas and um, that top 10% rule is big in Texas. And what I tell a lot of my families is that selectivity comes from what we're looking for as far as the whole student. So the process, are they looking at six categories to make their decision? Are they just looking at one or two? And I would venture to say all of us are looking at six, which makes it more of a holistic review. I always say we're painting a portrait and the more color we can have in that portrait, the better the admissions process will be for the student. So when I hear the word selectivity, all of us are very selective in the sense that we're asking for more material to review the student as far as closing the door. And I think I can speak for everyone in CTCL and on this panel, we're not closing the door. We literally like to open our door to find those students who are fit for our institutions. And so for families that you're working with, encourage them to go beyond just thinking about the highest test score. And a lot of us are going test optional right now, or the highest rank, um, but more so help their students put forth their best in every category, in their essay, in their extracurricular activities, in their grades over four years, not just the, the bottom line. So that's what I think when I hear the word selectivity, not so much the, the lower percentage of acceptance, but what is going into the process. When you come to a state like Oklahoma with your recruiters out there, uh, what kind of net do you cast when you're uh, recruiting a state that's, that doesn't have, you know, Oklahoma is not a very populated state like Arkansas. You know, what are you looking for? What kind of net do you cast? Anybody on the mm -hmm. panel? Right now, it's um, the benefit of virtual recruitment allows us to cast that net a whole lot wider. Um, I recruit all Texas schools typically, and now all of a sudden I'm actually able to go to a tiny little school in East Texas that I never would have been able to drive to because Texas is a little bit large. Um, but same with Oklahoma. Now we can go to so many different schools and schools will let us do virtual appointments, which we just absolutely love. Um, but for a school like St. John's, you know, being so unique and being such a niche market looking for students that are looking for a great book school, we have to always cast our net very wide. Um, and we know that we have to look for that unique niche student in all different parts. So um, we will work just about anywhere we can find some great students that are looking for our program. And I wanna follow up with what Caroline said for, for the counselors, especially right now, 
really reach out to us um, with CTC. I'll go to the website and I think Caroline dropped in there about the Speakers Bureau and there was a question, is there a cost? There's not a cost. Even this group, if you wanted to bring us in front of your parents to really talk through or some of your students to talk through, we want students to have an understanding of all of our schools, especially liberal arts, because um, there's a comeback. I don't know if y'all know that yet, but uh, liberal arts is really coming back. And so the, the net actually is being cast so wide. And I think even after COVID, you're going to see a lot more virtual experiences that we are going to be able to send a representative to your school virtually where it's not a lot of cost to it. Um, as well. So Oklahoma actually could probably be covered more than ever before <laughs> because of, of the opportunities that's being presented to us this year. There was a question in the chat that I wanted to highlight broadly. Um, the organization is formed out of the book that was being referenced. There is a book called Colleges That Change Lives and there's actually been four editions of the book. Um, but the organization and the book are separate entities. If you are seeking books, um, they are outstanding resources for your families from a philosophical sense. But I would be remiss if I didn't note that the book is about six years old now. And with any live um, breathing document, it's always as good as the minute that it's printed and then it, educational institutions evolve. So I think all of us would agree that the basic philosophies that are highlighted in the most recent book still remain very true about our institutions, that there has been some change. And I'll use Southwestern as an example. Um, our, our piece opens with how unique we are, that we are an institution in Texas that doesn't have football. And we've now had football for, for about five years. And so literally, as soon as the book went to press, we made an, a change. So um, use your local independent bookseller to buy those, or you can get them through Amazon. They really are a great um, resource for your families. And, um, and we encourage them to be used as a springboard for the conversation that we've encouraged today. And I see another question, um, and I'll punt this out to everybody. Any tips for counselors and teacher recs, especially given the uniqueness of this year? Everybody's looking I'll, around to see who's yeah, going to go first. <laughs> I know. I'll go. I, I didn't. I was. We're, we're so polite. <laughs> we take time, right? I would. I would tell you this, and this is what I've been telling my students: is that we are in a rare situation in the world, not just in our city, not in our state, but in the world, because we're all dealing with uh, the pandemic differently, but it's there, right? COVID-19, we know that word. So in, in what I'm looking for, what I'm needing uh, from Rex this year is not so much how students handled COVID or handled um, the going virtual, but what can you give us to assist us to help them make that transition? I think 2021, this class, is, is we know if they're enduring uh, this year, this season, that they've had to, to overcome some things. Can you speak to what they're overcoming uh, as far as uh, what they're doing in your class, their character, their value, so we can help them as they transition to our college? I, I think, let's be honest, this year, it seems we're all extending more grace uh, we're extending just kindness uh, to the students in this process because they already are in one sense kind of beat up. And as we send them, uh, as you send them to us, we want to make sure that we have in place what they're going to need to be successful coming out of COVID. So to me, that's my tip. Give us that information that will assist us in assisting them to continue healing and overcoming, because I tell you, 2021, if I was them, I wouldn't get out of bed, not even to go Zoom. So that's what I, that's one tip I would say. And just a side note, and I think everybody will attest, and even CTCL, if y'all want us to do sessions on writing letters of rec for your teachers, reach out. 
that's something that we do uh, and, and would love to, to help your teachers with that if we can. Just to add, I think what's critical is those late bloomers that you are all aware of that were literally making the U-turn right as COVID hit. Um, and whether your school went to pass-fail, um, fully virtual, those are the letters that are going to be essential because I, I hope what you take away is the success of students who are A's, students, B students, C students, and even those that have that falter a little bit towards the D, it's the internal motivator that we're looking for in evaluating that student for six, future success, for their potential here. Um, so this year, if of all years, junior grades that we would have normally really started to weigh success from? Is there a U-turn? Is there an upward trend? Those are not sitting there as we expect them to be. And I think we're all reworking that. And that's where the letter this year is going to be really essential for the smaller group of students who were really at that U-turn and you're seeing the great growth and you were really excited to write it because you were going to talk about what was happening in that second semester of junior year. But talk about what did happen, how they navigated, how they're continuing to navigate, and why, what we should account for in those first two years that they were transitioning out of. Um, so that'll be a, a great help. Um, and that, that's something I think we all look for, is writing that letter for that A student is really easy, but it's that student who you just started, it's all starting to bloom, that you really are gonna have struggle because you don't have the concrete evidence yet to show, but you have that gut feeling. And as much as it's the student picking the feeling to attend, you guys know our institutions well enough that we're looking to root for that student. And so if you root for that student in that letter, we're gonna be here on the other side saying, you don't see, see what they wrote here. We're excited about this. They're excited. Let's talk about this at an admission committee level. So. You're on mute, Christine. Yeah. Um, there's a great question that I'm glad someone brought up. How is the class of 2020 transitioning? And I think that it's interesting in the sense that 2020 doesn't know what they haven't experienced. Um, so while it is very different, they don't have a college experience to compare it to. Um, and I think in some ways that's a blessing in disguise, but I think they hear stories from their upper class colleagues on what the other side is. And there's a lot of longing for that. And it also depends there's lots of variation amongst our institutions as to what journeys we are traveling. We have some CTCL schools that are completely virtual this fall. We have some that are hybrid. Um, we have some institutions that are in person or are doing a, a mix of things. And so I think the question is also unique depending on the institution's environment or, or choice for the fall. But I think that in some ways they don't know what they don't know. And hopefully when they get back to the new normal, whatever that might look like, that it is the amazing experience that we know a smaller residential liberal arts and sciences institution provides. Are they having to adapt? Yes, but they were the king of adaptions when they had to jump into that pool in the spring and they already knew a little bit about having to navigate that. I think if anything, the challenge of 2020 is the social element. Um, unlike the sophomores, juniors and seniors that already had a cohort and had groups and, um, and were able or are able to still call upon those, the fall of the first year is when many of those cohorts established, and that has been a little more challenging in the online presence. And I think all of our schools are, are trying to work through that as, as we adapt. Um, but I would say that 2020, the, the class of 2020, they're gonna be one that employers are gonna wanna hire because they are the resilient class in a very unique way. And, and I'll turn it over to my colleagues to see if they would like to add anything additional. 
I think you're excellent with the response uh, with that. I, I wanted to, to bring out this question to the group to, to make sure we had time. What pieces of information do you share that seems to be the most powerful in helping students and families consider your programs? I feel like many of my students focus on nearby state schools, not that that is bad, and are unaware of other opportunities. Um, I like to um, use my own example of nonstop mistakes that I made in my college decision process um, because I did not think anything through. I applied to every college that mailed me an application. Um, I got accepted to the University of Arizona, never been to Arizona. Um, I just applied everywhere and I didn't know that I was supposed to research about fit or find a school that worked for me. And I made my decision to go to a state school that was two hours away from home that gave me free books and a free computer. And that sounded good. And so that's where I went. And it was fine. It served its purpose. But it was going to visit my brother at UMass Amherst and touring the grounds of Smith and taking my nephew to move into Whitman, which is a CTCL school, that it just hit me. And I went, oh my gosh, I should have been at a small liberal arts college. That is where my interests were. That was the type of student I was. And I had no idea even who I was at 18 to know that that's what I needed. And it's fine, I'm alive today, it's okay. It did not disrupt my entire life. I have been successful. But I think what I really try to work with my students is doing some visioning exercises. And I actually did this with a couple of our sophomores at St. John's who were trying to decide for this fall if they were gonna take a gap year or if they were gonna go virtual for this fall. And they were really struggling with that. And so we just walked through a lot of different scenarios. I do the what if. I said, okay, picture yourself right now this fall. You're not in school, you're not taking classes, you're at home because you can't travel. So what are you doing? Does it feel productive? Does it feel meaningful? Are you making money? Is it, are you doing something that you like to do? Or are you sitting on your parents' couch watching Netflix and feel like you're back in high school? Um, you know, Think about what type of school environment you wanna be in. Do you see yourself sitting in a big lecture hall and the teacher down front in that very collegiate feel, going to the football game with 50,000 other people? Or do you see yourself sitting on the lawn with a book and a teacher and like 10 other students? And just doing a lot of visioning exercises with them and taking them away from their friends when they're having that conversation, because there's a lot of that group think that happens. Um, and I just stress to students, that never pick a college based on where your best friend's going, your boyfriend's going, your girlfriend's going, your parents went. I love the conversation of, well, we can only go to Oklahoma State because that's where my whole entire family went. Actually, that's not true. You actually literally can pick another college if Oklahoma State is not perfect for you. Um, and so it just takes a lot of visioning exercises. And that's, that's what I try to work with on students who um, are struggling to think outside the box. And I just want to remind them. Oh, sorry, Bailey, go ahead. Uh, just to add on to that, it actually starts with you as the counselor. The more you know about other opportunities, and you you guys know your students the best. You know that, yeah, you'd be okay there, but what if I told you about this opportunity? Um, and so I think using the How to Choose brochure is even starting at sophomore year with them, talking about answer these questions, and there's a little like tear-off sheet that actually has even some great questions. And, and do the exercise, use the CTCL site as exploring outside um, what you think is possible. Um, and so it really is, it starts with you guys um, and it builds to us, it's connecting with us and we'll take it um, and lead it. But it's a, it's a partnership to get students to think outside what is spoon fed to them um, from the get go um, when, it, when it's a state um, connection. I also encourage that the ability to go somewhere else for four years is a very defined period of time. They're not committing a lifetime to leaving the state of Oklahoma. If Oklahoma is passionate in their heart, fantastic. Texans have great pride too, so I can appreciate that. Um, but the, the cool opportunity to go someplace completely different and meet people from a different part of the country, 
see trees or see different types of weather or not have to worry about Hurricane Alley. Um, all those sorts of things could be a great opportunity to experience life. And if at the end of four years they don't like that part of the country, come home. Come home with a great degree, with a great experience, and begin to make a difference back in your home community in a way that you might not have been privileged to do if you had stayed. I also remind students, um, you know, they think that big schools is going to mean huge circles of friends and huge experiences. And in some ways, 10 Saturdays of football does not make a college experience. But if you ask a graduate of OU or OSU, my guess is they will tell you that they have 10 really good friends from high school, maybe 20 really good friends from high school. And if you ask a graduate from a smaller institution, they will probably tell you they too have 10 or 20 really good friends from high school, but they have this tertiary band of colleagues and friends that they had in classes or they were on a team with or they were on the stage with that they know well enough and have an enriched connection to that has been lifelong. And so big does not necessarily mean you're gonna walk away with an entire Rolodex of people unless you've really worked hard to achieve that. In most cases, you're gonna have that same tight cohort, whether it's big or small. The difference that they will make on the campus though can be transformational. Awesome. I, I wanted to, to tie in what you just said all three of you about looking outside to, to the question about motivating our students. Mm -hmm. I had a, an opportunity because of COVID, I go to one store at a certain time, seven o'clock, and I spoke with this mom. She makes my sandwiches at the deli. And her son had basically said that he was not, not even interested in college. Mm -hmm. And I, and I said, oh, you know what? I, I work in college admissions. I'd love to meet your son. And as I was going to the store one day, he was working. And I said, can we just jump on a Zoom call? I just want to hear about you. And so I'm hearing about this question, how do I motivate my students that getting a, a high school diploma is important when their family the history of the family is working, right? Working is important. Um, and I, I had a conversation with this young man and here's what he told me. No, no school, no university would accept him. That's why he wasn't motivated. And so I know some of your students, and let's be honest, us too, or we're just lazy, okay? I'm, I'm not talking about those students. But the ones that I'm talking about that maybe first gen, they don't have a role model of someone who's gone off to college and been successful. They do have role models of hardworking parents who have, they get up in the morning, they go to work, they come home and they have clothes on their back and they have food to eat. That's their role model, which is perfect, which is great. But I think as institutions and then as counselors, the role that y'all have that we can motivate these students because they have to begin to believe in themselves. And this is where I encourage uh, counselors maybe to connect with some of the CTCL members, have them listen to some of the stories of students that are on our campus that were similar to that student right now that's not motivated. And again, and I know y'all probably think I'm nuts, but COVID has really, open some opportunities that I don't think we would have had open had it not happened. And that's that opportunity to jump on a chat, jump on a phone call. I think that's old fashioned now, <laughs> <laughs> but to have those conversations. And I think your students, it's, it's almost like that bridge to mentoring that they need to see someone, not an adult, <laughs> but they need to see peers that maybe were similar that are actually being successful because they, they did continue. They kind of did their homework. And just to give you a success story, that young man got his first acceptance letter last Saturday and his mom said he called all of his uncles, his aunts, and they said to him, we've not seen you smile this big ever. And this is the guy that was only gonna work at the grocery store 
and barely graduate. So the motivation is gonna come from us working together to help your students. Okay, I have a question for Beverly, Carolyn, Bailey, and Christine. I know you have a crystal ball in your office somewhere. And yes, the class of 2020 is here and they're resilient, but they were already in the pipeline. My question for you is we're all focusing on the class of 2021 now, right? What college trends do you see? I know some schools are gonna thrive, some are not. What are the enrollment trends out there for you that uh, the experts are telling you? All of our crystal balls are very fuzzy right now. Um, it, it's, it's about a hurricane level of what we were looking at, if that makes everyone feel better for a moment <laughs> with that. Um, I think following 2020, the class of 2021 sees this as their next step. Um, so actually, I think who were our juniors, you guys were already talking to them about college. They were already engaged. Junior year is a time that they were starting to dig in. Now they lo we lost spring. We don't have fall travel. And so I think those are the waters right now we're navigating that we're seeing nationally navigate. How does virtual experience of college fairs shift a little bit? Um, so though it's going to be a more uphill battle, I right now don't have as much fear as what your current juniors are experiencing and the lack of engagement where they would have started the process with this fall tra uh, travel season to get to know colleges. Um, so I, I, have, I have actually great concern for current juniors, which are the 2022 class. Mm -hmm. 2021, I think we're, we're working with, um, we're, we're having to work a little bit harder with to get them to engage and to drive and and really get them as all of your concerns have come through stay committed to their educational experience in high school and finish that strong so they're ready for the next step so i think 2022 can also be very interesting um if you know how the college search process works if those students aren't don't have access to the psat there will be limited ability for us to reach out to them unless they're engaging with us. And so to complement on Bailey's um, suggestion of 2022 may actually be the nervous point is it may be an empowerment opportunity that they are the ones that really need to engage with your virtual visits and they are the ones that need to participate in how do you do a virtual college search workshop um, because the traditional methods of filling their physical mailbox and their email box may not be in existence in the exact same way if we don't have a, a, a massive mechanism for which to get to know them and to get to introduce ourselves to them. And I think that's a very real possibility. I think the other very real possibility is what will the future of testing be? Um, and as we mentioned in our presentation, a lot of our institutions were test optional before the pandemic ever hit. So philosophically, this hasn't been a massive shift for a number of our organizations and institutions. But the question remains, if taking tests are difficult, um, are we going to have the, the educational bubble burst that lots of us have been anticipating for a number of years and will it start with testing and will there be a trickle down effect into other elements of the educational process? Caroline and, and Beverly were both highlighted for tuition resets. Cost has become an important conversation in the college going world. And so um, I think any enrollment manager is has 20 crystal balls on their table and are constantly shaking them for the right answer to, um, to come forth. But I'm really optimistic that this may be the much needed change that we're all aspiring for. And that um, it wasn't one institution that sparked it. It was something completely out of our control yeah. that led us to make um, education more accessible, more valuable and more realistic for the, the family that Beverly was talking to, 
all the way up to your um, private student, private school student that has resources. Everybody deserves this opportunity. Yeah. And so it's time that we're able to provide it. Beautifully said, Christine. I do want to add on the one thing that I'm hearing a lot of or seeing a lot of this fall is just this fear of like, oh my gosh, deadlines and deadlines, we can't get stuff done. And why are they still having deadlines early and things like that? I think the other big thing is the financial aid piece. Families are asking to fill out a FAFSA based off of 2018 information well before pandemic hit and hurricane mm -hmm. hit and everything mm -hmm. else. And so the most important thing is to tell these families to go ahead and fill out the FAFSA, fill out all the questions, but then if anything has changed in the family to immediately talk to the colleges that they're applying to. Because there are appeal processes, there may be more paperwork they can churn in to show loss of job or loss of house or medical expenses. Make sure that they're talking to families because that question is not on the FAFSA of, has anything changed in the past six months? Right. It'd be great if that was listed, but it isn't. Right. And so make sure that they're still going through the steps and that they're doing things early. You know, if they wait until next July to finally do their FAFSA for next fall, they're going to miss a lot of opportunities or they're going to be really frantic to get to the end point. So tell them to go ahead and apply now to do the FAFSA, to go through an appeal process if their college allows it, and then to talk about what their options are going to be for next fall. And just, it's, it's really just like go through the race and let's see what happens and don't delay um, and, and if you can go ahead and get it done now, it's going to make things a little bit easier. That's excellent, Caroline. That's good. I haven't I hadn't thought about that. I, Rick, I think actually, and Christine hit on it, it's a reset. It's a reset with testing. It's a reset with finances. It's a reset across the world. And for 20 21, 22, 23, uh, it's going to be different. And I think in a positive way, because here is the thing, every university, and I can say that in the world, was hit by COVID. Every high school was hit by COVID, every family. And so now, those things that were so important in the admissions process just six months ago, it's, it's not there. So I think it's a great opportunity to encourage individuals that were fearful of the test um, to begin to look at schools that were test optional. That used to be a language that we had to really explain to families what it meant. We're not doing that so much right now. And I have a feeling that some form or manner in testing is going to look different in the next couple of years. That's just, that's not a crystal ball, that's just fact. And then what I'm seeing is that all of us, all universities are going to need students to survive. And those doors that sometimes used to be really shut tight, closed, I think they're opening some. And so our message has to be about fit, those students understanding who they are and then finding those institutions that will best suit them in the process, not just with admissions, but with finances, with the community, which is what our university, CTCL, stands for. And so to me, it's opportunity. If, if, if these counselors and left here, I would want them to think, optimistically, that there are opportunities in the future coming for a lot of your students. Now it's just navigating the roadmap to find those schools. And I don't think that's going to be as difficult as it used to be. And I'm a tech person. I love technology. So I'm living in my world. But to have opportunity for students to jump on a chat and they're in Oklahoma and my school is in Arkansas or my school is in Texas or New Mexico are in DC and they don't have to pay too much to do that. We just pray that they have internet service. But overall, we're, we're headed in a good place. We really, I, that's what I believe, I'm Pollyanna, that's okay. 33 years and I think this is a good time for our students and families. 
Well, I, I just want to say, I, I just want to say how much I appreciate you talking with our counselors today and presenting to them on your schools. I think they're a special group of schools. The more awareness, the better for a private liberal arts school. I attended one myself. Um, so I'm a big proponent and I love that aha or light bulb moment when a student says, I didn't even think about that school, but when they go visit, it's just, it opens up their world. So uh, thank you. And I know our counselors have some, are able to email you and ask you additional questions. But again, uh, thank you for presenting to our, our counselors today. Thanks for having I us. I encourage the four of us real quick, just to put our email addresses in the chat since the session will continue to go on and that way if anybody wasn't able to capture our information that they can reach out to us individually and um, and we can help as we as best we can to everyone. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. We'll be sure we'll capture your email addresses as well and send those out just in case anybody misses anything in the chat. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. Hey, okay. okay. yep, we're, we're done. We're done. Um, if you have any questions, you can email us. We'll get you the information that you need. Um, but thank you all for attending today. We hope this was a, a great workshop for you. It's not a full day, but it's a short one. And we really appreciate your attendance. And I'll get you your uh, certificates out. And uh, just so you know, we are, I think we've had a few questions in the chat just about where this information will be found. Um, we'll go ahead and get the PowerPoints, um, the uh, email addresses, everything from CTCL, and we will email that out to you, but then also put it on our website. So thank you all so much. And we'll hang on here just a minute. If anybody has any last minute questions on the chat, but feel free to log off and enjoy your days. That's a, she's got a tough group of kids. Laura, we can, uh, uh, we will jot down what you said and we'll send that to the colleges that change lives to see if they can do some sort of video for you. But if I'm getting you, you'd like a message theme to focus on motivation and the importance of earning a high school diploma. Kind of what Beverly was talking about, I feel like. I really like her story. I'm gonna copy that. Well, let's see. Let's save the chat. Oh, great. Thanks, Laura.